I think our biggest challenge isn't necessarily health insurance. Everywhere I travel, people want to talk about health insurance. Um, but I think the more, more important things are our health and uh, the cost of our health care. And the two things that uh, I'd like to pr promote is a healthier Tennessee. The fact is the state of Tennessee is number six in the country in obesity, number eight in the country in smoking. We're actually number one in the country in uh, teenage obesity. And at the same time, we're 42nd in the country in uh, income. You put those things together, if we get the same amount of money as other states, we aren't going to be able to have the same kind of health care that other states have. Uh, we simply can't afford our health. So we've got to take a more proactive role in our health care, or our, our own health. The second thing, though, I think that we spend too little time talking about is the cost of health. I'll use an example. My company, eight years ago, decided to institute health savings accounts, uh, where we took people's uh, deduction from $500 to $5,000, but put $4,500 each year into their health savings account. The idea was to make them smarter consumers of health care. The thing I've found is that when you talk to people about their purchases in health care, nobody ever asks the price, and typically the seller, that being the doctor or the provider, usually don't even know the price. If you have a marketplace in which nobody asks the price and nobody uh, knows the price that they're selling, there's opportunity for improvement. One of the things that I would want to do is work with the federal government to get block grants. I think that if Tennesseans can make decisions for Tennesseans, we can find ways to expand care in a more efficient uh, and effective manner than having the Washington, D.C. tell us how to do it. So we want to work hard to be able to get as much as we can and have block grants so that we can make the decisions. With regards to health, uh, we've got to take a proactive role, especially with our children, in making sure that we're doing a better education, a better job of educating them around health priorities, uh, eating better, exercising better. So we're going to have to partner with our schools to be able to reach them, but I think that's a big opportunity. Also within that area, working with our employers. 96% of the people in the state have a job. At my company, we have a, a health and wellness director. We have all kinds of different programs from health risk assessments that will help our employees adopt better health practices. As a result, our insurance last year went down 16%. And then finally, with regards to um, reducing health costs, um, I think creating more consumerism, more transparency, more accountability. I was sharing the story about our health savings accounts with a, uh, a, an audience in Madisonville in Monroe County about a month ago, and the president of the hospital in Sweetwater was there. And he came up to me, and I thought maybe he might be offended by the fact that I was suggesting that we have uh, more accountability and transparency, and that would result in lower costs. But in fact, he actually came up and said, I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, at his hospital, he says on the front desk, he has a sign that says, if you'll pay cash, we'll give you 80% off your services today. I'm not sure if the savings is 80% or 40%, but there's bound to be a lot of savings in the system if he can offer 80%. So we've got to find ways to make the system more efficient. And improve the relationship between the doctor and the patient and try to get all the other bureaucracy out of the way. Yeah, so the first thing I want to have is a Physician's Advisory Council. I'm putting together one now uh, for the campaign, and that one will tr transition over to when I become governor. Um, I think that, like, almost everything else that I've ever experienced in life, whether it was trying to design pet products or uh, developing education policy when I was working for Governor Haslam in higher education, creating the Drive to 55, in every case, if you talk to the customer, the people on the front line, they usually have the right answers. My number one skill as uh, the governor will be to be a good listener. So in, in regards to uh, supporting our physicians, I need to have them at the table at, at, at every instance and making sure that they're heard. I'm sure if I uh, do a good job of listening to them, they'll be able to direct us in the right direction. I think the fact is we've got a great uh, uh, delegation that works with us, represents us in, in Washington, D.C. I would engage our U.S. senators and congressmen uh, and congressladies to uh, work with us to be able to make sure that um, Tennesseans get as much say as possible in our policies. Uh, ultimately, we would want to have block grants where we can make decisions for Tennesseans by Tennesseans. I think the big opportunity is just taking some of the bureaucracy out of the, out of the process. Um, I don't think it's, the, it's reducing the quality. I think, in fact, you can probably redu increase the quality. I think just the inefficiencies in how, we, um, how, how we've structured our system. We need to take m some of the middlemen out of the process and improve access and communication directly from the patient to the doctor. 
So I've traveled all across the state into all 95 counties, and I feel that there is an acute shortage of primary care physicians all in our state, in particular in our rural communities. One of the things I'm passionate about is helping our rural communities do better, and they're not going to be able to do better educationally or economically if they don't have good health. Uh, we need to do a better job of making sure that we reach our rural communities, and one of the key things is making sure that they have access to a primary care physician. Well, most of our, our training dollars, from my understanding, comes from the CME, which comes from the federal government. Um, I'd like to see the state step up and do more, and in particular with regards to rural health. Maybe we can talk to uh, uh, young uh, medical students and suggest to them, if you would like to be a primary care physician, um, the state could subsidize to a very large degree their education if they'd be willing to commit some number of years to our rural communities. Hopefully some of them will go there uh, as a mission, but they may fall in love with those communities and stay there for life. So on the uh, one hand, I really like the team-based healthcare solution uh, model. I think it's important that we coordinate and collaborate and communicate together. By doing so, we should get more effective, more efficient uh, outcomes, but at the same time, I've talked to a lot of doctors. I was talking with an internist in, at ETSU about two months ago, and he was explaining that sometimes he's held accountable for things that he can't control. And so I think while we can work toward this team-based approach, we also need to make sure that doctors aren't held accountable for things that are beyond their control. And I also worry that if we create criteria that, that sets that, that situation up, there may be certain patients that get uh, not, don't get uh, served because we're, we're worried that they would go beyond the cost model that they've been uh, uh, tagged with. And my understanding is there's been a lot of discussion around scope of practice, and um, on the one hand, I, I think it's a, it sounds like a fairly technical discussion that doctors and nurses need to be able to, and others need to come together to discuss, and so I'd want to be able to facilitate that and make sure that we do have a very clear uh, understanding and agreement there. But in the end, I think one of the things that we would want to try to solve for in that discussion is to make sure, back again to the rural health, that we can come up with some solutions to be able to provide primary care to some of these rural communities that aren't getting service today. Yeah, so I published a 10-point plan on how to attack the opioid crisis uh, back in September. You know, this is a, a, a real crisis. It's going to destroy everything we're trying to do in our state. So we have to take it seriously, and I would like to declare a state of emergency. I would like to appoint a chief epidemic officer. We need to have somebody in charge. We need to have metrics. We need to know what winning looks like. Um, ask somebody today, so what does success look like? We're, we're not defining it. We need to know what our goals are. And then there's two key areas that we got to focus on. One is prevention. The first of that is limiting the amount of prescriptions. And the second big part on the prevention is education. We need to make sure that children, that doctors, that patients all understand how deadly these are. And the final thing is recovery, and there's a lot of things we could talk about with recovery, but one big thing, our addicts today, their primary place for care and housing is in our jails, and they're not going to get better in our jails. So as a state, we need to take responsibility for recovery. We need to get back into mental health facilities and um, make sure that these people have a place to go where they can actually get treatment and hopefully get their lives back together. I think, you know, in, in the end, uh, it's still about being healthier and being smarter consumers of healthcare. Eighty percent of our healthcare costs are attributable to obesity and smoking. Um, we can control our costs if we can control our health. So we need to really focus on that. And again, the second thing is um, just providing more consumerism, more marketplace-driven decisions in the, in the healthcare area, I think, can show dramatic reductions in, in costs. We absolutely need to be able to find ways to provide more access to care for people all throughout our state. Um, however, Medicaid expansion as defined today is going to change. And so I think it would be wrong to expand a model that we know is, is broken and getting ready to change. So um, I'm hopeful that the federal government, before I get to be governor, has already made some, uh, come to some resolution. But if they haven't, uh, my job will be to go to advocate for a block grant. I say, we would like this block of money. Let us, let us make the decisions. I think with the episode of CARE, we need to bring physicians uh, to the table and talk about ways in which we can make sure that we can keep the good parts, which is um, the teamwork, the collaboration, the working uh, together to come up with a, a quality solution for each patient, but at the same time, not penalize doctors for things that are beyond their control. And I think we haven't got that last part right yet. 
Well, we definitely want to advocate for more graduate uh, medical education. It's federal funds, so it's going to be up to me to be up to go up to D.C. and and argue our case. We've got some great legislators there, in, in particular Senator Alexander, who uh, is on the, the chairman of the Health Committee. We've got to work um, with our allies in, in Washington, D.C. to bring as much money here as we can. And again, I think there is still an opportunity for the state of Tennessee to, to look at also supplementing this in particular key areas like in rural health. Well, I think that um, as a business person, uh, I share the same kind of concerns that uh, doctors uh, do. You know, I think both doctors and small business people were, were, were the same, and we have uh, some frustrations with uh, the, the liability system we have now. I worked with Governor Haslam in 2011 on uh, some tort reform that uh, I think had some good success for both business and for doctors, and it's something that I want to continue to, to uh, move forward with. Yeah, so with regards to the maintenance of uh, certification, I think there's an opportunity for us to observe what Georgia's just done. They've just uh, recently eliminated that. I think that the nice part about being a, a democracy with a lot of different states all innovating separately, we can let some others maybe innovate first and so we're not on the bleeding edge and see how it works for them. I think on the one hand, we want to make sure that we continue to have great quality of care, but we also, as a conservative, I, I like the fewer regulations and restrictions. So hopefully there's a balance there where we can find ways for continuing medical, medical education, continuing to uh, have great quality of care without burdensome regulations and rules. So I don't know the answer to surprise billing, but it needs to stop. So I think that's one of those issues in which insurance companies, hospitals, and TMA all have to come to the table and figure out a way to not surprise our patients with that. that at the end of the day, it's about, about the patients and this is not something that they can absorb. So we've got to come up with a better plan. So I read that uh, Felix Robertson started the TMA in 1834. He was also a mayor uh, of, the, of Nashville. And I think it shows that the TMA has always had a lot of involvement in public service. And I think that public engagement uh, it needs to continue. You've done, been a great partner to the state in the years past. And as governor, I want to make TMA a great partner of mine.